about things. We had three answers in the middle that were popular. So let's look at the, the two that you guys knew were nucleotide sequences. We're the promoter, so that's good, and the poly A tail. Both of those are nucleotide sequences. So we weren't so sure about these three. So where is the polyvinylation signal? In what molecule? mRNA. So is something in the mRNA going to be made out of nucleotides? Yes. So the polyvinylation signal is a nucleotide sequence. And this is an old exam question from this class. What about an intron? Where do you find an intron? In the pre-mRNA, right, or the primary transcript. Or you can have the corresponding sequence of the intron in the DNA, but this is also sequence. Transcription factor is the correct answer. What kind of molecule is a transcription factor? Protein, that's right. So the answer is D. I included this slide in your notes because there were a couple points I wanted to make. A few students asked me exactly what word I was saying. It was sense, and I realized that I didn't have the word sense written anywhere in your lecture notes. So I wanted to give you a slide where I actually written it out. Oh, it makes sense. <laughs> so the reason why I also want to show this slide is this word minimal I added to my version of your slide. And I wanted to make sure it was absolutely clear that this is just a minimal, minimal promoter. It's for the purposes of Bio 93 so we can talk about a promoter. Promoters are big, complicated DNA sequences. And we're simplifying them because you can understand the basic concepts of how they work from even just a small little promoter like this. I also wanted to reiterate that the promoter is a piece of double-stranded DNA. A number of people have asked me, is a promoter just a Tata box? And I said, no, it's got more different sequences in it, and you have to remember it's not just TATA, it's both sides. It's the complementary nucleotide. Okay, so the Tata box is a double-stranded piece of DNA. Does anybody have any questions about anything on the slide? We're good. Okay. So we also have to do a couple of the slides from the end of lecture 18. And when I was looking at them again, I went and checked your textbook. There's no definition of epigenome in the glossary of your textbook. So I decided to give you one. This is a synthesis of several definitions from other textbooks I have and what's on the web. So epi means above. And the epigenome is above the genome. It is the heritable chemical changes to the DNA nucleotides and the histone proteins of an organism that affect gene expression without changing the underlying DNA sequence. So you can affect the expression of genes without changing their sequence. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. Now we talk about specific availability of specific transcription factors regulates whether a gene gets expressed. Before that even, we talked about how the state of chromatin regulates whether a gene gets expressed. So this isn't new information. If the DNA is in this tightly compacted, condensed state, the genes aren't expressed very well. And that makes sense because all of this transcriptional machinery cannot access the DNA it needs to clot into RNA. When the DNA is in this more open state, then proteins like RNA polymerase and transcription factors can bind to the DNA and cause gene transcription. One way that the state of chromatin is regulated is modification to histone tails. And the kind of modification that's talked about in your text is acetylation. So here is a nucleosome. It's got eight little histone proteins there, and the DNA is wrapped around it. These tails of the histone protein are sticking out, and the little green balls represent acetyl groups that have been added to lysines on the histone tails. Now, do you guys remember why, what property of histones makes them associate with the DNA? They have a positive charge. Do you remember where that positive charge comes from? 
Why do histones have a positive charge? They have lysines and arginines, and they're our group, gives those amino acids a positive charge. So lysine and arginine are special amino acids because they impart a positive charge to the protein. So the amino acid that gets acetylated is lysine. And when you put an acetyl group on a lysine, it neutralizes its positive charge. So one way you can remember that acetylated histones are found on open DNA is you've decreased that electrostatic interaction between the histones and the DNA, the negative background of the DNA, because now the lysines aren't so positive. You can also remember that unacetylated histones, are also called deacetylated histones, are depressed. Transcription is depressed. People who are depressed are kind of closed and don't want to talk to people, right? So deacetylated histones are associated with DNA that's less active, not being transcribed. We talked about how modification of the histone tails can affect how tightly the DNA is packed and whether the proteins you need to transcribe can get at the DNA. Another thing mentioned by our book is you can methylate the cytosine residues in DNA. Methylated cytosines are still cytosine, so the sequence hasn't been changed. But the DNA becomes less active because it causes things like histone deacetylases to be recruited when there's a lot of methylated cytosines. Unlike your relatively static genome, your epigenome is dynamic. And what I mean by that is your genome is static. You can't change your genes over the course of your life. Your mom and dad dealt with the genes that you have, and you're kind of stuck with them. But your epigenome is under your control. It's dynamic. It will change depending on environmental factors that you're exposed to, and it can also change in health and disease. So one classic example of how the epigenome can affect gene expression is shown here. These two mice are genetically identical. They have the same alleles at every locus. They have exactly the same genotype. But you can see they have dramatically different phenotypes. This yellow mouse, its mom, is fed an environmental toxin. And that toxin turned the agouti gene on. And when that agouti gene was turned on, the mice became fat and sick. Now what was that environmental toxin? Bisphenol A. So I'm sure a lot of people have Nalgene bottles like this, these clear, hard plastics. They use BPA, bisphenol A, to polymerize that plastic. So baby bottles made out of hard, clear plastic. The inside of tin cans is coated with plastic that has BPA, BPA in it. It's all over the environment. That is a BPA-free water bottle, which you can buy now. And BPA has effects like this that have made it become outlawed in Canada, although the plastic industry will assure you that BPA is perfectly safe. No problems. But this is what it does to the mouse. This mouse, its mom, was fed exactly the same toxin, but at the same time, she ate a diet rich in methyl groups. So garlic, I think, is one example of a food that's rich in methyl groups. These methyl groups caused the agouti gene to stay off because it changed how the epigenome was affected by the toxin. This mouse stayed thin and healthy. So environmental exposures can dramatically affect gene expression in part through effects on the epigenome. One thing that's kind of creepy is even if this mouse is never exposed to bisphenol A, its pups will be yellow, fat, and sick just like it. So things that your grandmother did affect gene expression patterns in you. And some of these epigenetic changes can have tra transgenerational effects of three, four generations. So your epigenome is not static. It changes based on exposures to different environments. If you're interested in epigenetics, you can go see this little video at the Nova Science Now website. Okay, quick question. Albumin is a protein produced and secreted only by the liver. The histones associated with the albumin gene in a skin fibroblast are likely to be A, acetylated, D, deacetylated, or C, absent.
Give you like five more seconds. Okay, let's see what you guys think. So you did slightly better than section A. B is the right answer. Just remember when they're acetylated, they're open. When they're deacetylated, they're depressed and closed. This answer C, absent, is not a throwaway question. Do you guys remember, or answer, do you remember the two times when histones are not going to be associated with DNA? Hmm. When would you not want histones on your DNA? When you're copying it, right? So during DNA replication and during transcription, you can't have your DNA wrapped around the spool. You need to have it away from the histone protein so you can open it up and transcribe it or duplicate, replicate it. So during DNA replication, when the piece of DNA is being actively replicated or transcribed, it won't have histones. This is to summarize all the things we talked about in the nucleus that regulate gene expression. Up here, we just focus a bit on the chromatin. Chromatin states. The packing of DNA will affect whether the transcriptional machinery can get at it. We had transcription, so there's a whole bunch of specific transcription factors and general transcription factors, and their avail availability and activity will regulate whether RNA polymerase 2 stays bound to a promoter and it expresses the gene, transcribes the gene. There's a lot of ways that RNAs are processed and their stability is regulated. We talked in class about alternative splicing as a way to change which protein a given mRNA, a pre-mRNA might make. We talked about the cat and the tail being important for export to the cytoplasm as well as for stability. And today we're going to talk about gene expression, the section that happens in the cytosol, which is called translation, where we're changing the language from the nucleotide language to the amino acid. Now this is a mature mRNA that I drew myself, and part of the reason why I did this is because I wanted to encourage you guys to draw your own mature mRNA. You ought to be able to do this on a short answer section of an exam. You should be able to draw all these parts. There aren't that many. We have the five prime cap and the three prime tail. And then we have this part in the middle that we didn't talk about so much last time. We have the AUG start codon and the stop codon. So our three-letter nucleotide sequences that code for the initiating of thionine or cause the ribosome to fall off. In between the start and the stop, you have what's called the open reading frame. That's the portion of the mature mRNA that will be translated into protein. It's the portion that is read. The portion that is read by the ribosome is the ORF or open reading frame. People will frequently refer to it as the ORF. Then there's two UTRs. This stands for the untranslated region of the RNA. So the part that gets turned into protein is shown in green, but there's parts of the RNA that regulate stability or have other functions, and those don't get turned into protein. So I have another clicker question for you. Keep you on your toes today. Exons can contain sequence that does not code for protein. True or false? Okay, choose your poison. So you guys were reasonably evenly split, but the majority did get it right. That's good. Exons can, this is a common misconception in beginning students, can, can be things that don't code for protein. So these UTRs, where did they come from? The introns were all spliced out, right? So the UTRs had to be part of an exon. So the exons also contain RNA that don't get translated, the two untranslated regions at each end. Any questions? I don't think I stopped yet. Yes? Uh, which UTR does the SRP attached to? 
Which, oh, so which UTR is the SRP attached to? Well, the mRNA is read in which direction? Do you know yet? By the end of, of the lecture, you will know. Okay? So if, I, if you don't know by the end of the lecture, then you can ask again. Okay. We did that one. The answer was true. So this is a table of the genetic code. And one thing that confuses people is what is in this table. It's the codons. So this is the sequence that you will find on the mRNA. The anticodon is going to be the complement in an anti-parallel direction. So these are the codons on the mRNA listed from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. There is a lot of redundancy in the genetic code, which you can see if you look at this for a while. For example, serine here, there are four different amino or four different codons that are redundant. They all code for the same amino acid serine. The only two amino acids that don't have multiple codons are methionine and tryptophan. The third base is usually what is different when multiple codons code for the same amino acid. So here for our serine example, the first two nucleotides are always U and C, but what's in the third position can vary. Same thing for proline. First two nucleotides are C and C, but what's in the third position can vary. So we call that wobble in the third nucleotide. It doesn't, it's not as important exactly what that nucleotide is in general. Now that genetic code in that table is pretty much the genetic code for Earth. With a few rare exceptions, every organism on Earth uses that same genetic code. This has important implications. These are jellyfish, and maybe you can see that they're kind of glowing green. They express a protein called green fluorescent protein that when hit with light in a wavelength of 488 nanometers will fluoresce green. You can take this jellyfish gene for green fluorescent protein, hook it up to a mammalian promoter, and you can make mice that glow green like jellyfish. These are mouse pups if you've never seen young mice before. This is also used in medicine to make insulin. So back in the day, type 1 diabetics took insulin that was purified from pig, rat, horse, even fish pancreases. They would harvest all these pancreases at the slaughterhouse and then purify the insulin out of them. And that's what people would inject. Now that insulin doesn't have exactly the same protein sequence as human insulin. So there were a few problems with that. Now, what we do is express insulin in bacteria, in E. coli. And then you can purify the insulin from the E. coli, which you can grow in great big vats, and people can inject that. Then what they're injecting is human insulin, exactly, because it's the human gene that gets expressed in the bacteria with the right bacterial promoter. tRNA, carry the amino acids and base pair with the mRNA. So these guys act like the couriers that carry the amino acids to the ribosomes. tRNA are purely RNA. They're an RNA that functions as an RNA. They do have secondary structure, however, because they form intramolecular hydrogen bonds. That means they fold back and base pair with themselves. So you can see that these two strands are anti-parallel because the molecule has folded back around and now they're forming hydrogen bonds with themselves. And that will help to stabilize them in this particular structure. There is an amino acid that's attached to the three prime end of the tRNA through a covalent bond. Is this a peptide bond? Probably if I ask the question, it's not. Why is it not a peptide bond? What forms a peptide bond? Two amino acids, right? This is not a bond between two amino acids. It's a bond between a nucleic acid, a ribonucleic acid, and an amino acid. So this is a covalent bond. We refer to the tRNA as amino acylates. They're amino acyl bonds. It's not a peptide bond. The tRNA has an anticodon on one end that will base pair form hydrogen bonds with the mRNA in an anti-parallel fashion. So down here you have the mRNA 
And the codon that we base pair with this antiphoton would be what? What would base pair with A? U, U, C, right? So that's what you would find in the table of the genetic code, is U, U, C. tRNA genes are transcribed but not translated. What do you think? True or false? Okay, go ahead and click in. You guys are pretty evenly split. This is the same thing in A. I was a little surprised by this. Okay, tRNA genes are transcribed. What's transcribed mean? What to what? What's copy to what? DNA to RNA. So are tRNA transcribed? Yes? Translated. What's that mean? Turn into a new language, right? RNA to amino acids. Are tRNA turned into amino acids? No. So this is an example of a gene that is expressed after transcription. It functions as an RNA. tRNA are not translated by the ribosome. They help the ribosome translate the messenger mRNA. Any questions? Okay. So the amino acyl tRNA synthetases are the proteins that I say translate the genetic code. And this is, this is an explanation of why I say that. But I also want to remind you that translation, like transcription, takes a lot of energy. There are lots and lots of steps where we put energy into translation. And this is the first one we're going to talk about. Charging or amino acylating a tRNA costs a pyrophosphate off an ATP. So here's our enzyme. First thing it does is binds the amino acid that it's going to put on tRNA. It also binds an ATP. And this reaction begins with the amino acid being hooked up to the AMP. So it forms an amino acyl bond with the AMP. This releases the pyrophosphate. Then the tRNA binds the tRNA synthetase recognizes the anticodon, so it hooks the right amino acid up with the right anticodon. It transfers this amino acid from the adenosine, the AMP, onto the tRNA, and then it releases both the AMP and the charged or amino acylated tRNA to go be involved in transcription. So, or I'm sorry, in translation, not transcription. The tRNA amino acyl synthetases are the enzymes that decide which amino acid goes with which anticodon. They write the dictionary. Depending on which amino acid they bind and which anticodons they bind, they determine how the mRNA will be translated, how it will be turned into protein. So I think your book may say that the tRNA translates the genetic code, but really the enzymes that make the tRNA are what translates the genetic code. This is just to remind you, because people always forget, this is not a peptide bond that's formed. It's between a nucleotide and an amino acid. Okay? How many tRNA synthetase genes are there in the genome? If you don't know the answer, take a logical guess. So you need to have one tRNA synthetase 
for each amino acid. So for serine, the amino acyl tRNA synthase that puts serine onto tRNAs will recognize anticodons that correspond to all of these codons. And that wobble comes because this particular nucleotide isn't, it, the binding doesn't need to be as tight. So that's the wobble. That site can vary a little bit, that nucleotide. So now we're going to go through the three steps of translation. We have initiation, elongation, and termination. And each one requires the input of energy. So first we have initiation. In eukaryotes, the small ribosomal subunit with the initiator tRNA bound finds the 5' cap and stands down until it finds the start codon, the AUG, which base pairs with the anticodon on the tRNA for methionine. Methionine is the first amino acid in all proteins, for the most part. There's always exceptions. But generally, methionine is the first amino acid, but frequently it gets cleaved off later by peptidases. So every protein in your body doesn't necessarily start with methionine, but when it was first synthesized, it did. Methionine can be present at other places in the protein. This is something that beginning students frequently get confused about. You have a methionine at the beginning of the protein, but you can have 10 more methionines scattered throughout. In the middle, at the end, it's the same tRNA that codes for those methionines in the middle of the protein as the tRNA that was responsible for initiating translation. So there's only one methionine tRNA. The same one is used for initiation and elongation. And the mRNA is read 5' to 3' by the ribosome. So the ribosome will scan from 5 to 3. So the 5' end will be the first part that's translated. After you get the small subunit bound, you're halfway there, but you also need to get the large subunit associated with the mRNA. And that costs you a GTP. Now, once you have the large subunit associated with the small subunit on the initiator tRNA, you're done with the initiation phase. When you're done with initiation, the methionyl tRNA is in the P site. On the next slide, it might be a little bit easier to see which is the A, the P, and the E, but this is the A, the P, and the E site. Now we're ready to elongate the polypeptide. And that happens in cycles until we get to the stop codon. So this is one cycle that we're going to go through here. You have three sites in the ribosome. And the tRNA, except for that initiator, starts out in the peptidyl site. During elongation, all the tRNA enter the A site, move to the P site, and then move to the E site. A stands for acceptor. So it accepts the tRNA into the ribosome. P is the peptidyl site. And E is the exit site. That's where it leaps. And if it helps you remember that it spells, it spells A, so you can go A over translation, then move from A to P to E. The tRNA comes into the A site. The one that enters has to bind correctly with the anti the anticodon on the incoming tRNA has the base pair with the corresponding codon on the mRNA. Then the ribosomal RNA, the ribosome, will serve as an enzyme that catalyzes peptide bond formation. So the energy that's stored in that amino acyl bond that charges the tRNA can be used to form a peptide bond. And when that happens, this growing polypeptide chain is transferred onto the tRNA in the A site, the acceptor site. After that, the ribosome will translocate and the tRNA move. The one that was in the A site moves to the P site, the one that's in the P site moves to the E site. And once it's in this E site, it exits. So then you're back at the beginning, you have the polypeptide on the tRNA in the P site, and you can go through the cycle again. Now this, to add one amino acid, cost you a pyrophosphate off an ATP, right? Because you had to charge this tRNA. And then, to add this amino acid, it costs two GTP. One of those is important to make sure that the anticodon and codon are base paired correctly. It maintains the fidelity, the accuracy of that base pairing. And another one is used for ribosomal translocation. So it costs this one ATP and two GDPs to add a single amino acid to a polypeptide. 
Translation takes a lot of energy. The formation of peptide bonds is catalyzed by which of these? Meoacyl tRNA synthetases, RNA polymerase, ribosomal RNA, tRNA, or the SRT? Oh, I didn't have to close it? Sorry. I missed it closed by itself. Oh, it must have been the old question. Okay, quick in. Let's see what you guys think. So that's good? The answer is, in fact, C. Let's go back and look at these. So amino acyl tRNA synthetases form what kind of covalent bond? Amino acyl bond, right? Amino acyl tRNA synthetases. ACE means enzyme. When you see ACE, it means it's an enzyme. This is a synthetase. So it's something that synthesizes something. What's it synthesize? tRNA that are amino acylated. What about RNA polymerase? What kind of bonds does RNA polymerase form? Phosphodiester bonds. That is correct. Again, we have an ACE. It's an enzyme. This enzyme makes Polymers. It makes polymers of what? RNA nucleotides. So it has to form phosphodiester bonds. And then the ribosomal RNA is the right answer. Is tRNA an enzyme? No, it's not an enzyme. It doesn't have an enzymatic function. It's a courier. It doesn't catalyze a reaction. It just brings the amino acids to the ribosome. And the ribosomal RNA is the enzyme here. The last stage is termination. So when you finally get to a stop codon, you're not going to elongate anymore. You're all done. So what happens is a protein release factor bonds. There is no stop tRNA. Instead of protein bonds to the stop codon, hydrolyzes this amino acyl bond. So the peptide, polypeptide flows away. The tRNA goes away. And then to disassemble the ribosome takes some energy. It takes two molecules of GTP. So now you're done. You've made your protein and disassembled the ribosome. <coughs> Terminated. Now what we are doing with all of this is, of course, making polypeptides. We were forming peptide bonds. And this dehydration reaction that you learned about in the first half of the course was catalyzed by that ribosomal RNA. One thing I want to call your attention to is that, like DNA molecules, proteins have two different ends. They have polarity. <coughs> proteins have an N terminus here and a C terminus here, where the carboxyl group is. Proteins are polymerized from N to C. So the initiator methionine is here at the N terminus, and the stop codon would be right here. So the last amino acid added is at the carboxy terminus. Carboxy terminus. So this would be a, a, something I could ask you on an exam. I could put a picture like this and say, where is the next amino acid going to be added if this is a growing polypeptide chain? Is it at A or B? Mm, what do you guys think? I thought this was an easy one. Where is the next one going to be added if they're polymerized from N to C? B, B, yes. The next one will be added here. N to C. Just like when you polymerize DNA or RNA, 5 to 3, the next nucleotide is added to the 3' hydroxyl. Okay, to overview or to review what we just went through, there's an animation from your book. In translation, a cell reads an mRNA message and assembles a polypeptide accordingly. We can divide translation, the process of building a polypeptide, into three stages, initiation, elongation, and termination. Translation is initiated when the small ribosomal subunit binds to the leader at the 5' end of the mRNA molecule. The anti-codon of the initiator tRNA binds to the start codon, AUG. 
The initiator tRNA always bears the amino acid and the thiamine. Proteins called initiation factors help bring the mRNA, the initiator tRNA, and the small ribosomal subunit together with the large ribosomal subunit to form an initiation complex. The initiator tRNA sits on the P site on the ribosome. Elongation of the polypeptide now occurs, with the amino acids being added one by one. The codon in the A site of the ribosome pairs with the anticodon of the appropriate tRNA molecule. Part of the ribosome catalyzes the formation of a peptide bond between the amino acid extending from the P site and the amino acid extending from the A site. The tRNA in the A site now translocates to the P site. The tRNA that was in the P site moves to the E site and exits from the ribosome. Meanwhile, a new tRNA brings its amino acid to the A site and the process is repeated. Three special base triplets, UAA, UAG, and UGA, do not code for amino acids, but instead act as stop codons, which terminate the process of translation. A protein called a release factor binds to the stop codon in the A site. It acts to free the completed polypeptide from the tRNA that is in the P site, and the translation assembly comes apart. The polypeptide becomes folded, modified, or combined with other polypeptides to form a functional protein. Okay, there's another animation that I like. It goes a little bit faster paced than that one. It's got bacterial translation, so if you want to watch it, you can watch it on your own time. I have this homework problem for you, but I want to make sure we get through the other stuff. So I want you guys to do this as homework, and we'll go over the answer on Wednesday. Look at it carefully when you answer that question. Okay, that's an old exam question, the translating RNA one. All right, so DNA mutations and their effect on translation. There are several different causes of mutations to DNA. It could be x-rays, radiation, UV radiation, chemicals in the environment. All of these things can cause changes in your DNA. Most of them are actually going to happen in non-coding regions. Only about 2% of your DNA codes for protein. 98% of it does not code for protein. So most of the time, mutations in the DNA won't change the protein sequence. You could have mutations that affect gene expression for sure, but 98% of the time, they won't change the coding sequence. Now sometimes those mutations do occur in the coding region of an exon. And we've got four names for them, silent, missense, nonsense, and friendship, and we'll go through each one of them. So the first one here is a silent mutation. This is a change in the DNA that causes zero change in the protein. That's because of the redundancy in the genetic code. So the example I'm showing you here is if you have UCU in the normal DNA, or in the normal sense strand, normal mRNA would be UCU, and it's changed to UCC, both of these codons code for serine. So there's no change. It's a silent mutation, no effect on protein sequence. The next kind, just a little bit worse, is a missense mutation. Again, it can be a point mutation. It's a single nucleotide change. But here, instead of changing UCU to UCC or UCA, they've got UCU to UUU. Now you're changing serine to phenylalanine. So you're switching one amino acid for another. If that's what we call a conservative change, those amino acids are similar, it might have very little effect. If those amino acids are structurally very different, it could have a large effect on protein function. Right, like sickle cell, was sickle cell anemia was caused by a missense mutation, a change of one amino acid. Cystic fibrosis can be caused by a missense mutation a change of one amino acid. So I don't want to imply that a missense mutation doesn't have a major effect, but sometimes it doesn't. My word example here, these are my, my letter codons. 
The big cat ate the rat, would be the normal sequence. And I could have a missense mutation that changed this to the big kid, the big cat pig the rat, which doesn't make much sense. It's a missense mutation. That would be a non-conservative change. It changes the meaning of my phrase. But I could also have a conservative mutation. The big cat bit the rat. Bit is a lot like eight, so you could probably figure out what's going on from this. It's a conservative mutation that didn't change the meaning that much. We also have nonsense mutations. These are mutations that change an amino acid codon to a stop. So in my example, UAU went to UAA. So that changed tyrosine to a stop. And that can have pretty large effects on protein function. So in my word example, the big cat ate the rat, and the nonsense mutation becomes the big cat. Now you really don't know what I was going to say. It could have been anything. It's nonsense now. It has no real meaning because we've truncated the protein. It could dramatically alter its function depending on where that nonsense mutation occurs, how far into the protein. And the last one we're going to talk about is a frame shift mutation. These guys are real bad guys of mutations. This is the insertion or deletion of one or two nucleotides. So in my example, we're deleting this G in the green box. The normal reading frame is GCG and then UCU. But when you eliminate this G, you move this U into this codon. So now we have GCU, CUU. So what used to be alanine, serine, tyrosine is now changing something totally different. Phenylalanine, leucine, blah, blah, blah. The thing about a frame shift is every amino acid after that insertion or deletion is going to be different. And it's going to be junk. It's going to be stuff like translating an intron. It's going to make no sense at all. So frame shift mutations can be very devastating. And I think this word example helps make that point. So here's the correct reading frame. The big cat ate the hot dog. Now I'm going to delete this one T. And now I have junk. When I change the reading frame, it's nonsense. If I delete the T and the H, more nonsense. Frame shift mutations can be very devastating to proteins. So, if three nucleotides immediately following the AUG, that's the initiating AG, were deleted, would this best be described as what kind of mutation? A silent, nonsense, missense, frame shift, or a deletion?